Firefighting is ranked as one of the most dangerous professions in the country. Those in the profession say firefighting cannot truly be felt or understood until one walks in their boots. So as part of the Milwaukee Fire Department's continuing effort to educate the public about its profession, a number of people in the community, including myself, were invited to be a firefighter for a day. During our training that day, I found myself using a hose to extinguish a fire working with a paramedic team on a simulated 911 emergency call. But before experiencing some of those jobs firsthand, we spent some time in the classroom preparing for each exercise. We're going to give you just a small snapshot of what it takes to be a firefighter. In reality, it takes us 20 weeks, 18 to 20 weeks, to train a raw recruit. And when that recruit leaves here, that person is an asset to their company immediately, that day. They have to be because they don't have an extra person on the fire engine or an extra person on the ladder truck where this person can just watch and kind of learn as he goes. He or she has to be fully trained and functioning and ready to assist no matter what comes down the pipe. EMS training alone, if you wanted to be a paramedic, it's over a thousand hours of training. To be an EMT, it's over 150 hours of training before, before you even get an opportunity to use some of this equipment that you're going to be able to use today. Why do we put such a big emphasis on fire when EMS is such a big part of our house, or part of our job? Because the fire aspect is where our people get injured and get killed. And that's the priority that we have to do. Safety is number one, safety for our people, safety for the community. Sure we get hurt, sure we get injured lifting cops and doing things like that. But those injuries heal. If you get hurt in a fire, if you're not sure what you're doing, those injuries may not heal. So we put an inordinate amount of time, some people think, on fire training as opposed to EMS training. Our classroom instruction included learning how to use the self-contained breathing apparatus. 30 minutes of compressed air available, but in practice under stressful fire conditions, much less time. We were given a brief introduction to CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Emergency medical calls account for about 75 percent of the 200 calls a day to the Milwaukee Fire Department. Open the airway, you want to look at the chest to see it rise, you want to listen for air and you want to feel for air. If you don't see any, you're going to try to ventilate the patient twice. You saw the chest rise so we know it's not an obstructed airway. Then you want to check for a pulse. The patient has no pulse. You want to check approximately 5 to 15 seconds. You're going to bear the patient's chest, you're going to go mid-nipple line, one finger width below the heel of your hand, and you're going to compress at a rate of 15 compressions to two ventilations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Place the uh, bag mask on the patient, breathe twice, letting the chest rise as well as recoil. The department demonstrated its newest defibrillators, which are being installed on 60 fire vehicles. A recent USA newspaper survey of 50 cities ranked Milwaukee third on the list in survival rates following cardiac arrest. That's only because lay people in Seattle and Boston had more access to defibrillators. We're trying to get paramedics on every engine, and this is pretty much comparable to the one that the paramedics use. And they're going to be able to use their full scope of medications once they have this because they'll be able to read the EKG on here as well as get a hard copy. Currently with the unit we have, they can't use all of their medications because they have no way to monitor a patient. This will monitor the patient as well as defibrillate. When 911 calls come in, they're triaged or sorted based on the caller's report of the major complaint. The closest and most appropriate unit and potentially other units as needed are dispatched um, at the same time. The first unit dispatch could be a fire engine or a fire truck, which leads us to probably one of our most asked questions is, I called the paramedics, why did I get a fire engine? That's, that's why. Because we're strategically located throughout the entire city. It makes our response times to the emergency. 92% uh, of times we're there in, five, in less than five minutes, which is an excellent response time. We've got over 50 first response companies, the engines and ladders, that go out on the initial call. 
to handle the emergencies. But we only have nine ALS transport units. Therefore, it's imperative that we take care of those units and only dispatch them as needed. So the most efficient and effective use of them is to, do, to triage our calls. That's why paramedics don't respond to every single medical emergency. We're, we need them for the most critical uh, with life-threatening injuries. Tom, what we're trying to do is just trying to create an awareness of, for our citizens about what the Milwaukee Fire Department does. Uh, many times we, uh, you know, glamorize at times the uh, events that occur. Um, we see the news reports, we see a significant fire or, or auto accident, and we associate those events with the fire service. And we don't want that to be the only connection that our citizens have. We want to have an awareness of our citizenry that what we do every day, over 200 times a day in the community, is more than just that that you see on TV. It's uh, the training that we are involved in. It's the actual um, minor events, perhaps, that somebody sees a need, um, they have trouble breathing, or they have that minor fire inside their house, and we still go and take care of those events. Um, that we have a lot of resources available to us, and that we're very efficient with those resources. We have a lot of specialized equipment. We invest a lot of time in specialized training, and we utilize those components so that when we need them, that we can be very deliberate and very focused to make sure that we're dealing with the events um, one at a time and give them a lot of attention and, and resolve them appropriately. Upon completion of the classroom training, we were outfitted in identical turnout gear that is used by every firefighter in the field. Just getting ready can be a challenge. The bulky heavy uniform, compressed air tanks and other gear weigh about 80 pounds. We then moved from station to station to complete each exercise. Those who attended this firefighter for a day program included members of the media, county training officers, and representatives of the Milwaukee Common Council. It's an interesting concept. I think that uh, uh, the public needs to know how important it is for us uh, to support those who uh, protect our lives when uh, uh, it's in jeopardy. Uh, what I've learned throughout this whole process is that, you know, the, the men and women who serve in this particular department um, have a, a training beyond what the general public understands. And I think that uh, as we support um, in these days and times that we're moving through time, um, it, it, it is imperative that we make sure that they're well equipped, well equipped with those tools that they need in order for them to perform their duty. It's a civil service just like anybody else. And I think that uh, these guys that we have here within the city of Milwaukee, I compare them to anyone around the country or throughout the world. I think that this was a fabulous concept. I'm, I'm very, very glad that Chief Wentland gave uh, myself and others the opportunity to come in and at least get a very small flavor for what uh, our, our firefighters do on a daily basis. So many things that we take for granted uh, was a very, a, a very good learning experience for me in terms of how comprehensive and complex the job truly is, much beyond what you normally think of in the day-to-day -day firefighting opportunities, that there is so much more that they train and prepare for and do it do on a daily basis. Uh, they do a tremendous job, and, and, and we're truly blessed here in the city to have a tremendous firefight, firefighting team that we do have. What we do with our recruits when they first come to the academy is Put them inside, we're going to move to the smoke. Um, looking how it changes the atmosphere, how it smells, what it tastes like, how it blinds you, all the rest of that stuff. And we're just using two barrels of hay. Smoke does seem to have a feel to you. It kind of makes you claustrophobic, you know, and um, it's something that you have to overcome if you're going to be a firefighter. Now, what we did before we got the cameras, which was only two months ago, is we went in environments like that all the time and we kept our orientation. Yeah by making sure that we had a wall or we knew where the hose line was going and we made sure we hugged that wall, did our little searches where we had to do, go back to that wall, come out the same way. Um, that's the only danger of these cameras. If you go in there blind and we're just looking through the camera, you're not acclimating yourself to the room. If the camera goes dead on you, then you're in trouble. Our paramedics, our EMTs, uh, our, our firefighters in general are trained exceptionally well in the city of Milwaukee. We spend many, many hours teaching and training. Our paramedics, again, are trained for well over a thousand hours just to get a paramedic license. Our EMTs are trained for 150 hours plus, and we have to maintain that with various training episodes during the course of the year. Plus, all of our firefighters are CPR trained as well. Uh, and that's why we're ranked so exceptionally well in the country. The realism is a great big part of it. 
And, and normally you would think it's merely an evolutionary process where we use our people and their skills and talents, go in there, go to work, one, two, three, four, and we're done. It's usually not that way. We do have to use the evolutionary process, but there's always extenuating circumstances that enter into it and make the, the situation usually a lot more difficult. So when we work a code for a PNB, there are relatives present who are very emotionally distraught. That's usually the case, and that's why we wanted to inject this in this particular scene, just to show you that this is reality. This is what we're usually up against. Reviving the people with CPR, putting the defibrillator on people, using the thermal imaging camera, spraying water on fire, those are the glamorous things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that make the headlines in the news. Beyond that, our people have to be very proficient in raising ladders and chopping with their axes and moving and handling hose lines that are putting the water out and so on and so forth. They put literally thousands of hours a year into training and practicing and retraining to make sure that it's the last thing they have to think about is how does this ladder go up? Not necessarily how. It's more important for me to have them understand where to put it up, what to do with it when it is up, how we're going to carry that person down from that window, how we're going to get to the roof, what part of the roof we want to put the hole in. You don't need to be thinking about how to put the ladder up. So we do it enough so we can do it in our sleep. And we wanted to give you that taste of it today, too. Well, the whole purpose is to um, show people uh, what we do in the case of live fires. Um, it's a very controlled environment where we, we set uh, uh, a couple of box springs on fire, let people lay a hose line, uh, enter the building under SCBA, and uh, uh, put the fire out. It's important because it, it teaches us uh, the, the, the proper and safe ways in, in managing uh, emergencies that involve in fire. Uh, staying low, uh, proper management of, of a hose line, uh, proper ventilation. Um, all those things are critical in, uh, on the fire ground. Uh, though a smaller percentage of the calls we get are fires, um, without a doubt uh, situations like this uh, can have catastrophic uh, consequences if things aren't done uh, in a proper fashion. Part of it is exercise, part of it is to build upper body strength, but also when we go to a roof to affect topside ventilation, as we showed you in the building when we light a fire or when we have smoke, it all rises to the top or to the ceiling. If we don't open and allow it to come through to the roof and come out the top, it's going to come out the sides of the building and actually catch the buildings on either side on fire. So we try to force the ventilation through the roof of the building. We'll put people on top. We'll cut a hole in the roof and allow the heat, the smoke, and the fire to come out that way. We use power saws on a daily basis, and our power saws are very good, and the guys are real well trained with them. The power saws are a mechanical tool that don't always work. Your axe always works. You never have a problem starting that. So when, when a push comes to shove and the saw doesn't work, you take out your axe and you chop the hole. We gave everybody an opportunity to do the swamp, and the swamp is an evolution that we teach our people in order to teach them nozzle control and the ability to handle a hose line in any situation. If you're inside a building and the kitchen floor gets wet, it gets very slippery. It's no different than the wet grass or the mud that you experienced in the swamp. We show how teamwork is so important, how hose management is so important, and how nozzle control is so important. And we create zones in the swamp that show you can do this on your feet, then you have to do it on your knees, and then you have to ultimately be on your stomach because the heat layers were getting so, so hot that we got you in as far as we could. And we made you roll over and come out backwards mm -hmm. with the water coming over your head to protect you from all that heat that you were experiencing. When we go to a catastrophic event in the city, it's not for practice, it's for real. And when we go there and do CPR, do defibrillation, put out a fire, it's our job, but it's dramatically affecting and having an impact on the citizens. And part of our responsibility is to understand that and have an appreciation for what dynamic just happened in their lives as well. We can't just walk out with the patient, put him in the back of a med unit and send him off. We have to recognize the feelings of the family that was left behind and try to deal with that aspect as well. Or when there's a house fire, and that's probably the single most catastrophic event in that person's life when their house is burning, yet we come in and we, we think we did a great job, nice save, nice stop, whatever, we got to also temper that with the realization that sitting right next door crying is the person that lived there and all of their treasures and all their belongings went up in smoke. We have to have an appreciation for that as well. So what we try to impact, impart on our people is a recognition that we want to be aggressive, we want to be motivated, we want to do the job to the best of our ability, 
But the bottom line is to recognize that we're just human beings trying to help other human beings. In addition to firefighting and EMS duties, many firefighters take on additional responsibilities as members of special teams. We expect to see a firefighter in this situation, a hot fire, a heavy hose. But sometimes the equipment is an ice auger and the uniform is a wetsuit. Last February, we followed the fire department's dive rescue team in a training exercise in Brookfield, a windy and cold day. Air temperature in the upper teens, water temperature in the mid thirties. The 25 acre lake gave the firefighters a different kind of water rescue than they'd find in the Milwaukee Lagoon or Lake Michigan. We do the training here in the winter time just to get acclimated to the temperature and underneath the ice. This is about the worst thing you can possibly do is ice time. It's a serious, serious thing, but we have to get the guys trained so that tonight at midnight if some child breaks through the ice in one of the lagoons or out in Lake Michigan, we have to go in after them. So we come out here train and get the guys used to going under the ice this time of year. I think the hardest part was going right under the ice at, the, at first. The body tells you no get out you're not supposed to be under here just like when you're you fall through the ice the first inkling you get is to get out and once you get over that then that's uh, that's okay actually this time of year it's the best time to dive because all the allergy algae and that is gone and it's clear as can be under there at times it's all nice it's not disturbed by anybody else swimming under there any boats or jet skis we go through a lot of training before we even get out here on the ice we uh, we go through a lot of training in in-house teach everybody how to uh, uh, use the rope systems that we use. We have backup divers like we always do, but we, we have rope after rope tied on so that in harnesses so you don't fall off. Safety for the dive rescue team members is a priority in this training, and they say safety should be on everyone's mind when going out on the ice, especially when you're not familiar with the body of water. Early ice people think it's safe enough to go out, which it isn't. Out here now we got 18 inches of ice, which you could drive a vehicle out here. People uh, still falling through every day. Nobody can really read the ice because of the springs and and uh, the hot, warm temperatures at times it causes all different ice formations. Best thing is to stay off the ice, which is never going to happen. So actually know your ice conditions. That would be the safest thing. Here's another situation for the fire department and a special team. A car crashing through the side of a house. This was a training exercise last March for the department's special heavy urban rescue team. It might sound improbable, but it does happen. We had a woman uh, approximately three years ago that was sleeping in her bed and a auto that was being chased by police went out of control, ended up going through the home and ended up on top of her in her bed. Uh, second one that we had more recently was an auto who lost control, or a person driving an auto who lost control, went up a hill on the first, or in front of the home, and ended up sitting on top of a woman, sitting on her couch watching TV. The heavy urban rescue team, or as we know it as HURT, uh, consists of 90 members of the fire department, and they're specially trained in a variety of areas, including rope rescue, which is high and low angle type rescues, uh, trench rescues, structural collapse rescues, which is uh, what we're doing here today. Also tunnel rescues and confined space type rescues. Today, what we're doing here is we're, we're simulating something that's happened uh, quite a few times in the recent past and twice, twice where we've actually had people that have been stuck underneath the vehicles. Uh, we're simulating a vehicle that's either gone out of control for whatever reason and ended up inside of a house and it, the structure of the house is compromised. And in this case, we're simulating that a person is stuck underneath that vehicle also. The house itself is compromised on a variety of levels. Uh, because the vehicle came in through a sidewall, it took some of the structural stability away from the home. What we need to do is shore up on the exterior so that this home doesn't begin to rack or fall in any direction. And when we begin to lift this vehicle, what we need to do is shore up on the below so that we have something to push off of. So we need to shore up in the basement to support this first floor and also as it came through it took out supporting members to the second floor and we need to stable that up, stabilize that also. First and foremost obviously is the safety factor here. We need to make sure our firefighters are safe but more importantly we have to make, take care of our victim and make sure our victim is safe. So all the while we will be tending to that victim and staying with that victim. Um, the importance of the heavy urban rescue team is safety. 
safety for the citizens of Milwaukee and also for the firefighters on the department. Um, not that we are the only people who know how to do structure collapse rescue or high angle rope rescue. We have the tools and we work with these tools regularly, training and, and on scene of different responses. And we're more familiar with it. And we're here to support the rest of the fire, the fire department. And that's, in my mind, the importance of the heavy urban rescue team. If it is a question of sacrificing the safety of one of our firefighters in order to get to a patient, chances are we won't do that. Will we try to get access to the patient as quickly as possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if the patient needs to have an IV um, installed, we'll, we'll do that. If, if the patient needs to have some bleeding stopped, we'll work very hard in, in any which way we can to get that done. But, you know, we have to work within the confines of, of the safety of the firefighters as well. There, there's a lot of very dedicated individuals on this team that they do be over and above, uh, they do work over and above what a normal firefighter will do. And uh, they're very, very dedicated to the team and to the community. We have firefighters on the team, not necessarily officers, responsible for training 90 people in the Milwaukee Fire Department. You know, this is, this is something over and above. It's very extraordinary. The people on this team are very dedicated. As Captain Miller discussed earlier with you guys, people go all over the country to get training on their own time and on their own dollar. And about 75 Milwaukee firefighters are members of a third special team in the department, the HAZMAT or Hazardous Materials Team. While every firefighter receives some hazardous material training, this team is specially trained to deal with situations involving nuclear, biological, or chemical threats. The department continually stresses safety, firefighters protecting themselves as they protect others, but it is a dangerous profession. And that point was also brought home during Fire Prevention Week. Two more special teams, the Fire Department Color Guard and Pipe and Drum Corps, joined with their colleagues and others for Milwaukee's annual Fallen Firefighter Memorial. The fire helmet, folded protective coat, and empty boots represent the 106 Milwaukee firefighters who have died in the line of duty. We are only men and women. Firefighter is our name. And day and night we're ready to go and fight the flame. When we leave the station, we don't know what we'll face. It might j just be a false alarm or might just be a race. To save a life of victim trapped within the fire and smoke. Most times we win, sometimes we lose, and then our heart is broke. Some people call us heroes, but it's just the job we do. We're thankful we can be there and do these things for you. And we provide our service in a very fair manner, very equal manner, because there's nothing that levels the playing field more than disaster. When they go into that smoke-filled building, they can't tell if they're going to save a, a child, a parent, a man, a woman, a white, a black, a Hispanic. They have no idea. But they're going to do that job and provide that service. This memorial has come to be the voice of all who have fallen. A voice that speaks every day to those of you who serve, to those of you who have served, and probably most importantly to those of us who are served. A voice that speaks the same lasting message expressed with two simple yet powerful words. Earn this. There are insurmountable challenges at times being a firefighter. And as firefighters and paramedics, you face them every day. Our firefighters understand and their families accept that dedication, their courage, their service, and unfortunately at times their sacrifice are expected of the men and women of the city of Milwaukee. I encourage everybody today to pause and read the names on the monument. As you recall the names on this monument, 
take comfort in knowing that these brothers and sisters that are enshrined here were engaged in the most honorable of professions. It truly takes a special kind of person to be a firefighter, a person who values and treasures every life above all else. Since the dedication of this monument, we come back to this hallowed ground every year. We come back to remember our fallen heroes. We honor their courage. We celebrate the enormous contribution that each one has made to our community. And yearly, we come back to express our support for them. This was the seventh firefighter memorial to be held in the city of Milwaukee. The first annual Wisconsin Firefighter Memorial Day was also held this year on October 4th. Governor Doyle signed the legislation establishing that annual event. The governor said the day not only memorializes those who have lost their lives in the line of duty, it also thanks them for the work they do and recognizes the importance of well-trained firefighters. Many of us in the community learn firsthand about that training and have a new understanding of what it means to be a firefighter.